thanks to issue thanks to judith uh, and uh, bidisha and uh, toma for organizing this event dance especially because uh, you know uh, i mean uh, this is something you know as a researcher we are expected to sometime we are expected to uh, uh, keep a distance from what we study what and what we research on huh? but i think this time but this type of event or this time of theme uh, I, i mean it makes it difficult to 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 maintain research huh? we, we actually get involved in into all these things huh? i mean looking at the first uh, first the, the, the first film this morning you know i mean uh, it was actually you know a touching experience also so thank you so as you can see i'm presenting uh, life of pi okay and i always mispronounce it as life of p sometime i don't know why so if it happens in the middle just forgive me for that okay so <clears throat> so i start with the with the quote in the book itself when your life is threatened your sense of empathy is blood blunted by a terrible selfish hunger for survival says pisin patel which is the name of pi you know in, in the book the protagonist of life of Five, which and you can see the book cover. The novel, uh, written by Canadian writer uh, Jan Martel, obtained a Man Booker Prize in 2002 and was made into a motion picture by Angel Lee ten uh, years uh, later. Okay, so this is the uh, this is the poster. Okay, so I'm not go I'm not going to deal with the movie. I'm, I'm going to actually deal with the book. But as you can see, uh, the movie has uh, you know there's a typical Indian boy standing. You know. is as indian as one can get you know, with his attires and all these things and even the boat looks like a bit like a, a musical instrument huh? okay so 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 there are many icon iconographic uh, elements in the in in the in the poster so uh, and uh, this odyssey of pi uh, as actually suggests the title of the movie in french okay so this is the uh, poster of the french uh, in french uh, so Uh, revolves around the life of pi in south india pondicherry his journey on a ship in the pacific ocean so from pondicherry to canada and later on a shipwreck and pi survival uh, the french title thereby provides uh, the movie title i mean you know kind of provides uh, with an incipit of the whole story as opposed to a somewhat generic connotation given by the uh, the english title which is life of pi so uh, the french title also takes a leaf out of homer's classic and the justice of the book as the diegetic time in the novel is full of adventures for pi the english title that had life instead of odyssey uh, insinuates that the whole life of a survivor and not just the time when he's grappling to survive is an odyssey so as you would perhaps never cease to live those moments of near death experience that equally translated into the survivor abandoning momentarily his humanity and adopting the animal instinct of survival <clears throat> so the plot revolves around pi his father his mother and a brother who run a zoo in pondicherry so they actually own a zoo uh south india and they are required to flee the country due to the politics of indira gandhi and the imposition of emergency rule in the 70s so the diegetic time in a novel written in 2002 is uh, is is, is uh, mid 70s to late 70s which carries an intertextual wink with another indo canadian author rohinton mystery who wrote a novel called such a long journey published in 1991 where indira gandhi rules uh, indira gandhi's rule sorry uh, slowly trails a nation suffering with birth pangs to dictatorship <clears throat> uh, pai's father decides to leave india and settle down in canada and to take his zoo animals along with him even though the pretext of fleeing india does not hold water uh, what follows is a trail of adventures that result in a shipwreck in the middle of the pacific ocean Uh, resulting in the losses of both animals and human beings and also resulting in the loss of innocence for 15 year uh, 15 years old pi uh, so pi sorry so he's just 15 years old at, at the whole time of adventure the sole human survivor of this shipwreck is piscine so his first name is uh, so his first name is piscine as i already told you which actually means uh, a swimming pool in 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 french uh, so the the sole survival is piscine and a bengal and and a tiger and a bengal tiger which is like almost like 420 pounds um, quote from the book 
a hyena, a zebra, and an orangutan. <clears throat> they all land on a lifeboat. And because of the tiger, because of the tiger's presence on the lifeboat, Piscine has to move to a raft lying nearby and attach it with the boat. So a surreal situation in which Piscine has to share his only life support, the boat, and cross the Pacific Ocean. So it actually puts Piscine in the category of not the boat people, but in the category of raft people. Okay, And the book reads like not a road movie, but more like an ocean movie, uh, like an, oh, sorry, an ocean book uh, as compared to a road book. So Piscine's sea adventure ends when he lands in the Mexican territory. Okay, so he, he's going to Canada and lands in Mexican territory and because of this whole situation. So um, it slightly reminds of what, what was said in this morning. Uh, okay, he drifts. Mm, uh, and where he narrates his account to the Japanese ship investigators who are actually uh, investigating the insurance claim and who are not, believe, uh, who are not willing to believe his account which is actually a stark reminder of uh, so many survivors, so be it Holocaust or genocide, you know, when they came back, you know, they were not believed, you know, I mean, the horrors were not believed in. So, so as many ho historical ac accounts has revealed, survivors have to live with a trauma, a trauma of having survived while others were perishing. So Piscine bears this, uh, bears the death of his people and his animals on his conscience. And here, in this case, a literature through imagination and artistic creativity perhaps managed to fill the gap left by the absence of a real victim, encompassing thereby a reality that could otherwise be lost, as Primo Levi insinuated in his Drowned and the Sound, that there cannot be a real witness account of a victim because the victim has actually perished. So through this presentation, uh, so he was definitely referring to, uh, Lee was definitely referring to Auschwitz and gas chambers victims. Huh? So th through this presentation, I'm going to perhaps foreground the role of literary fiction in underlining the despair and trauma associated to the loss appearing in the form of dead bodies in the middle of nowhere, the place where, which we can also call an ocean. And uh, then I'll also emphasize on the representation of an even bigger tragedy, that is a survivor's predicament of mourning those personal losses and concurrently overlooking them in order to concentrate on a survival in real time. So <clears throat> uh, with his Life of Pi and uh, later on a follow-up uh, 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 book called Beatrice and Virgil, uh, uh, Jan Martel underlines the role of fiction in the vast ocean of witness accounts that falls under the category of fiction. So another important aspect of the novel is uh, is that it's it, it's it's quite avant-garde, uh, as you know, it captures the death in ocean much before the real horrors start appearing in popular media and on social media. So mainly uh, the, the case in uh, Lampedusa in the Mediterranean Sea. So does fiction undermines nonfiction? I mean, this has been a debate all, all the time. So the writer appears to have a double aim of engaging in literary terms, in literary terms, sorry, the reader with the ordeal of the survivor and the victim, and to make him deal with the fragmented account of the survivor, precisely because it becomes a part of the aesthetics of memory, shaped not only by what was really lived, but also by the trauma that was lived during the journey. So, and uh, similarly in her Boat People, uh, a novel by Sharon Bala, uh, it addresses the nature of uh, trauma of war refugees trying to prove their innocence and their non-cooperation in war, neither as soldier nor as militant, one of the major criteria to make them eligible for demanding a refugee status. In Life of Pi, Piscin is not confronted with such tribulations. Yet the common denominator remains the fact that Balaj refugees and Martin's piscine are expected to speak and to speak up before claiming a refugee status, a victim or survivor's need, status need to be claimed. A refugee's demeanor is ascertained in order to see whether he or she can be a good refugee or not. Piscine goes through this demeanor test test towards the end of the novel, where he's expected to narrate a straightforward account emanating from his role of a shipwreck, shipwreck victim. And then uh, to the uh, Japanese ship, ship investigators. And what he does instead is 
invent a story or rather two of them. One version is apparently reserved for the reader and another one for the both, the reader and, and the investigators toward the end of the novel. So can one narrate in a linear manner after having experienced a traumatic experience? Uh, the novel's narrative strategy also lies on the primacy of Prescient's soliloquy that lasts almost till the end of the novel that gives the impression that the vast ocean is a theater. His imminent spectators are mute animals who would not speak and readers who could not speak with uh, Pi. So this strategy helps also in underlining the overbearing solitude of the survivor since he's speaking all alone. And at the same time, his account remains untallied as there is no other survivor. In fact, according to Bissin, uh, the, the sole other survivor, the Bengal tiger, conveniently leaves his company at his arrival on the Mexican beach, never to be found again. So the reader also delves into the psychological <clears throat> condition of the main protagonist. Bissin is handed over the agency on his current situation or his narratives. Paradoxically, because uh, it's, a, it's a paradox because he never actually had uh, any agency on his situation. Uh, he, he never chose to be a victim uh, in the first place. The reader is under the obligation to believe his fairy tale narratives. Uh, traveling in an ocean on a wooden raft for more than seven months in the company of a Bengal tiger and discovering elements that almost appear like fantasy, it appears that trauma may lead to a creation or a recreation of one story. A similar narrative strategy appeared in a movie called Train of Life by uh, Radhu uh, Mihai, in which the lead character creates a hilarious tale of their escape from Nazi invasion of the village, which was also a tragic comedy and a road movie or rather a track movie, uh, as most of the action takes place on a train journey. So as opposed to 15 years old be seen, the audience watched Train of Life through the eyes of a town lunatic. The common denominator in both movies uh, and the novel being the innocence of the narrator and their ability to create a story for themselves in order to survive the trauma. So another common element could be the use of humor in case of be seen, which actually makes the story both incredible and non-credible. Uh, so uh, there is this uh, survival guide, uh, uh, just um, copied it from the book. Okay, uh, and this is actually a, a, a real piece of document. So this survival guide reads like a gallows humor in the middle of the ocean. In, as such, is, it's not humoristic, but if you read it in the middle of the novel where actually he's trying to survive and he comes across this, uh, this, uh, this British survival guide, you know, it actually reads like a novel. Huh? And actually it reminds me of what was said in the morning. Huh? You see, just look at the first one, do not drink urine or seawater or bird blood. So. Uh, so uh, this document actually P remembers it by heart uh, and it actually makes him a comment on a small uh, childhood trauma that he had lived that was actually his name was Pi but since it was a short variation or a diminutive of P scene people called him Piss. Uh, his, his classmates called him piss and he had to give a whole lesson to them that it's not actually piss it's not it's not actually p as piss it's actually pi as the theorem pi so um, so so the narrative sense of humor humor usually comes to an end with the bouts of rational also leading to a hopelessness so for example he comes uh, just immediately after this thing he comes a castaway's word worst mistake is to hope too much and to do little uh, kind of uh, um, this is like a, his rationale. The ship named Simpson, uh, I don't pronounce it very well, on which the whole family is traveling with their, animal, with their animals from the Pondicherry Jew, takes its inspiration from the biblical myth of Noah's Ark, okay, because there's a family carrying animals and all this thing. So, uh, and it also results in the creation of two different narratives with one being having a predominantly animal characters and the other one with human beings at the core of the narration. So we thereby come across a development of a new type of ecosystem with animals, humans, and fish all becoming a part of the same story, as if the writer were telling us that there cannot be a survival story emanating from the sea or the ocean that does not have other type of characters than just human beings. Uh, uh, Pai had imposed upon himself a religious shroud uh, that was before the shipwreck happened. Uh, he had visited all the possible religious places for praying and even started calling atheism as just another form of religion. So this was again his 
his life prior to the this 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 thing and this religious cloak started showing wear and tear when he's confronted with the reality of a survivor he eats raw fish well actually which was against his belief he was he, he turned to be vegetarian he eats raw fish turtles and even dolphins by killing them with his own hands the religious dimension plays a vital role in most of the survival tales <clears throat> So Charlotte Innes, who shared this book as well, refers to this novel as, I quote, a religious book that addresses to a non-religious person, and uh, which also has a reminiscent of uh, the novel that once, like Judith says, said me, and, was, and I, I read it after that, it was called Goat Days. So uh, it was written by Benjamin, um, a Malayali writer, and uh, in which, uh, the it's again a first person account of a of a migrant and so benjamin and pisin in these novels revive the attraction towards a religious dimension in the middle of the tragedy the proverbial the proverbial dichotomy between religion and rational outside the parameters of tragedy appears to blur during a tragedy that had certainly occurred to a human error the religious dimension, its absence toward the middle of the story, the use of humor are the elements that Janet Reno would call a healing process in his or her story. Uh, uh, seen after a bout of religious flirtation with gods from all regions that are available in India, had been uh, living quiet life with his uh, parents. Huh? So here he discovers a new way of treating the tragedy that has befallen him in the ocean, story creation. Although it takes him far away from his metaphysical belief system that he previously had, he discovers like Max Schulz, um, a character in Nazi and the Barber by Edgar Hitchner, that God remains unavailable in the time of life-threatening crisis. It brings him closer to an intellectual exercise that allows him to delve into reality of the situation. Uh, so he loses, as I said previously, uh, his innocence. and. Uh, and even before the shipwreck, now let's talk about the pragmatic aspect of the of the present in the novel. Huh? Even before the shipwreck happened, Piscine had realized that this journey would not be that of a traveler. I quote, the ship was no luxury liner. It was a grimy, hardworking cargo ship, not designed for paying passengers or for their comfort. Another uncomfortable element that points towards the perilous nature of the journey is that Piscine and his brother had been aware of the perils they were running by being on that ship. I quote, something was wrong with the engines, he said. Did something go wrong with the fixing of, fixing of them? I don't know. I don't think anyone will ever know. The answer is a mystery lying at the bottom of thousands of feet of water. So Simpson was bound to sink right from the beginning. Moreover, the ship had a Panama flag. And according to a BBC maritime report, uh, Panama uh, ships registered, no matter the country to which they belong, uh, the, the ship that are registered in Panama, I mean, for tax evasion and for all these things, they usually have their fitness certificates bought in the market. So they're not actually fit for, uh, they're not always fit for, um, for, for doing such a big journey. Huh? So as a migrant, the tragedy becomes more poignant as he didn't choose it. So um, the fictionality of the novel appears on many levels. Huh? And it appears that almost as if the writer, Martel, had not done his homework before writing the novel. So Martel has chosen a surname Patel for a guy living in South India. Well, it is, it's not impossible, but mainly it's a, it's a more prominent name in the, in the Western part of uh, India. And from all accounts, Pondicherry never had a zoo. Uh, it never possessed a zoo. Huh? Uh, Piscine uses miles and pounds as measures, whereas it is predominantly the metric system that is used in India. We use kilometers and uh, kilograms. Huh? His maternal uncle, his mamaji, has got two passports, Indian and French, which is impossible. Okay, uh, even today it's impossible. Huh? So, uh, so, uh, uh, so, moreover, in the 70s, huh, if I'm not wrong, the uh, UK and the USA were the main um, destination for, for, for immigrants uh, traveling from India uh, because of some Canadian laws. The ship sinks and along with sinks his innocence. So it's, it's, it could also be read as a coming of age novel. Huh? Uh, so his life is also a proof that there are many other challenges to be faced. Huh? As a matter of fact, the immediate survival 
merely separates the survivor from a victim. The trauma that comes along with the guilt of having survived, as it was the case with Mahindan in the boat people, builds up on the reality in which loss becomes a reality of their day-to-day -day life and their survivals become a, even a bigger necessity in a face of tragedy. So as Pisin sees it as a child, he was never willing to leave the country. Yeah? So, I mean, he could have stayed over, uh, back in the country. The decision was reached at a drop of hat due to the upcoming sufferings and due to the fact that they had time and resources to flee the country. Uh, this aspect of the novel highlights the horrific dimension of surviving. It is mainly those people who manage to flee and probably survive who can obtain means for doing that. It's, it's, so it's not within the reach of everyone. Similarly, in the boat people, Mahindan was required to sell everything, his jewelry and everything. But the idea was he had resources to, 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 to escape his country. Huh? I mean, the people who did not have, they, they had to live back and die. Uh, uh, peace, uh, so Pi's story further reveals another darker peril that puts it to test the very notion of humanity, which is defined by Cambridge as all people. So it includes, uh, it uh, excludes uh, animals. So it, uh, uh, so for example, Primo Levi, um, similar to um, this novel, uh, underlines the predicament of a survivor in a very first survival account novel called If This Is the Man. Uh, no, sorry, it's not there. Uh, the title raises question over the existence of putative elements of humanity or towards prevalence or even existence of humanity while facing a near death experience. Humanity that is supposed to be a pillar on uh, which respect and goodness are based. So uh, Pai's trauma stems from the loss of his family that was on board with him. However, most of his immediate bereavement period is marred by his attempt to keep himself alive. In the story number one, from a predator, the Bengal tiger, and in his story number two, from the French cook who, uh, who has turned cannibalistic and from hungers and tiredness. I quote, I was no longer crying because of my family or because of my impending death. I was far too numb to consider either. I was crying because I was exceedingly tired and it was time to get rest. So uh, Avi, this idea is, uh, yeah. Apologies, um, three minutes left. Okay, pretty much perfect. So this somehow uh, this also echoes in uh, Levy's account uh, when he says that because of the constant imminence of death, there was no time to concentrate on the idea of death. So, uh, so now what happened uh, since? Uh, 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 so all this uh, notion of creating and recreating story, uh, it brings us to a point where we start asking ourselves, is he not just uh, the survivor of a shipwreck running from a war or from a genocide who just created a story of a zoo in Pondicherry that had never existed and of his Indian maternal uncle holding two passports and started talking to his Canadian reader and the post-destruction host in the language that the letter understood using miles instead of kilometers and pounds instead of kilos. A creation that also reminds us of uh, George Perrick's novel, um, which is called W uh, in French and W as W, double life, okay? Uh, uh, or the movie Train of Life, as I previously mentioned. Uh, so this healing process is also in, in function over here when they are creating this whole story. So, and uh, in, a, in an interesting quote, uh, P replies to his Japanese ship insurance, doesn't the telling of something always becomes a story when he's asked by them not to narrate a story, but to give a straightforward account of what happened, echoing what Levy had said uh, uh, regarding his own memory. This book is drenched in memory. It draws from a suspect source and must be protected against itself. So in order to conclude, I would just quickly say that, uh, so while Levy was using allegories of shipwreck in his, in his book, Drowned and the Drowned and the Saved, Martel uses allegorical elements from uh, like Simpson, which is a Hebraic word, which, which means um, uh, uh, absence, sorry, presence through the absence of God. And the tiger that we see in the picture, huh, we come to know that it was the alter ego of uh, Pi, okay? So, which actually gives us the impression that, you know, only the survival of the fittest is possible huh, as he killed the other people. So the people he killed was, <clears throat> one of the person was chosen as a French cook. Huh? So um, 
again, this is a kind of a, uh, obsession of um, Jan Martel with the Holocaust story, because the cook is not a French as a matter of chance, uh, because it's a French cook. Uh, it allows the author to give a to have a historical link with the with the story, uh, basically with the Second World War. Uh, the mother calls him, you monster, you animal, how could you? He's a human, he's your own kind, pointing towards the French implication perhaps in, in, in Holocaust. Uh, and in, in his own interview to Ruth Franklin, Jan Martel said, the idea of turning around and killing your friends, neighbors, the Holocaust stayed in my mind as a surreal oddity right from the, his youth. Huh? So with his, with his life of Pi and Beatrice and Virgil, huh? Martel keeps on experimenting with literature on survivors and bringing the debate to the fore whether literary tools like allegories and personalization can be personalization of animals, huh? can be accepted to depict the tragedy of survivors. Thank you. Can you see that now? Yeah, good, good, good. So, okay, we're ready to go. Uh, just as a coder, I'd just like to say that um, I think it's a very strange thing to write about your PhD student. And I, I did this, I did it just because there was nothing else I wanted to write about. And it's a strange moment that I had to kind of deal with some kind of ethical issues, but I just gave up on the ethical issues and just did it anyway. Uh, it's stunning work. And the other thing to say about it, I think, is it's not, it's about, for me, it's about bodies uh, disremembered in British history. So, and some of these bodies are at the bottom of the ocean, but a lot of them are just utterly forgotten. Uh, so they live their lives and they're now forgotten in British history and we're trying to, Jade in particular, is trying to bring those bodies back and those people back. Clay is a beautiful, oh sorry, our landscape is its own monument, its meaning can only be traced on the underside. It is all history, Edouard Glisson from Caribbean Discourse. Clay, 2015, is a beautiful elegiac and haunting 10-minute film made with great sensitivity by Caitlin and Andrew Webb Ellis. It depicts a simple act. A naked black woman digs with her bare hands in the clay earth of North Yorkshire to the sounds of natural silence interrupted by distant birdsong. She's alone in the landscape and her isolation seems total. The experience is constructed as bleak, remote, unforgiving, unhearing, without union or unity with other bodies. As she excavates, her body is covered in the wet clay she digs. Her hair, her face, her limbs, her buttocks, her stomach, her breasts all become a slimy mess. She immerses herself in the land literally and figuratively. There are close-ups of this process that emphasise the labour involved in dirty work and the bodily efforts required to do the work, referencing a whole history of black bodies' physical efforts for little tangible personal reward. There are long shots, too, of the figure in what is becoming a pit, digging, surrounded by acres of empty land. Her lonely, isolated status in the harsh environment is exacerbated by these shots. As she extracts the wet earth, she piles it so it resembles the walls of a shelter, almost as though she is dry stone walling, a common Yorkshire means of enclosing land. Has she created a burial pit, a shelter, or a wall, or all three? Is she a grave digger, a craftsperson, or a putative homemaker? She is all three, expressing mourning for black lives lost through the history of slavery and its aftermath, creating new other lives in alien worlds, and finally making homes. The multiplicity of the film is central to its powerful meaning, in which the artist and performer Jade Montserrat seeks to articulate her claim to this alien British rural space as a black woman. In this, she consciously dialogizes black histories with the narratives of other groups, such as working class rural laborers, whose work on the land is so often minimized by processes of elision, similar to those used against black presence. And we can see this in the history of uh, British um, uh, 
literature, culture, and art. Think of the novels of Bronte and the kind of um, working class experience which is marginalised there. You could particularly see it actually in the film of Wuthering Heights, the contemporary film of Wuthering Heights, which uh, sees Heathcliff as a black man. Um, and when uh, Montserrat talks about her work, she often invokes the Brontes who come from uh, a place within 50 miles of her. Her process illuminates a multi-directional memorialization that Michael Rothberg has posited as a way of describing the intersections of vernacular memories that are too often bifurcated. Memories, he says, are not owned by groups, nor are groups owned by memories. Rather, the borders of memory and identity are jagged. What at first looks like my own property often turns out to be a borrowing or adaption from history that might seem foreign or distant. Memories have an anachronistic quality. It's bringing together of now and then, here and there, is actually the source of its powerful creativity, its ability to build new worlds out of the materials of old ones. It's memories and anachronistic quality that Montserrat feeds off in this work, summoning ghosts from the past, from here and now and from there and then, routed across nations and continents, all memorialised in the clay earth of her alien home space. The elemental nature of the work, getting down and dirty in the very clay that in many African and diasporic myths of origin births humanity itself, aligns the work with deep time as well as recent history. Montserrat's praxis with its summoning of such deep time narratives allies her with an environmentalist poetics and politics as discussed by Tom Griffiths. Deep time, he says, and social history seem to be antithesis of one another, each operating on utterly different timescales and subject matters. One conjures up ancient evolutionary history, even a non-human world, while the other suggests the study of modern society. One deals in awesome geological eras, while the other takes its chronological scale from a human lifespan. <coughs> it is one of the challenges to connect them, to work audaciously across time, as well as across race and species. As well as its relation to such elemental stories, and thus its links to deep time, the work crucially nuances our understanding of Black British history and of Black Atlantic history through its intersections with local histories and memories. And Montserrat's praxis in her work echoes Rothberg's and Griffiths' theoretical ideas on multi-directional memorization and environmental politics. Her emotional attachment to and care for local space links her to other artists working with landscape. As Yvonne Reddick, in describing the poetry of my late wife, um, Elizabeth Burns says, art that responds to nature nowadays has one foot planted in the local while the other feels for a foothold in the world that is increasingly marked by, by migration and global environmental issues. It deepens our connection to the place where we live and sharpens our knowledge of how the environment is wider and wilder than our home turf. Simultaneously, local and global concerns are figured in Montserrat's art of landscape. She undertakes what I describe elsewhere as a guerrilla memorialization in this Yorkshire clay, intervening in that hitherto designated white rural environment to posit its link to black lives historically and now. Montserrat's digging, making artwork resembling a grave, is redolent of mourning for those lives lost and forgotten and a reinscription of them in the historical record. In this she could be said to be engaging in a ritual, what Paul Ricoeur has described in his monumental work, Memory History Forgetting, as performing an act of memorialization struck through with the power of burial rites. He says sepulchre indeed is not only a place set apart in our cities, the place we call a cemetery in which we depose the remains of the living who return to dust. It is an act, the act of burying. This gesture is not punctual. It's not limited to the moment of burial. This, um, the sepulchre remains because the gesture of burying remains. Its path is the very path of mourning that transforms the physical absence of the lost subject into an inner presence. The sepulchre as the material place thus becomes the enduring mark of mourning, the memory aid of the act, the sepulchre. 
this transformation of the physical absence of the lost object into an inner presence is crucial to an understanding of Montserrat's work as an act of recovery of black lives marginalized, killed and forgotten in this landscape and beyond. Likewise, the act of digging into the earth to construct a grave-like pit is a ritualized, ritualized guerrilla memorialization that works against melancholic forgetfulness. She makes a mark of mourning for those for whom there had been no previous recognition. Uh, and I'd just like to contrast this to Ingrid Pollard's pastoral interlude, uh, because that work is a work of a metropolitan artist going into the countryside. It's very fine work. And she's in the Lake District, showing the alienation of black figures in the Lake District. Uh, but what Montserrat's doing in comparison is showing that these places are home spaces for black people as well. Edouard Glissant, Glissant has talked about enslaved Africans and their descendants' relationships to the alien lands they inhibit, inhabit. And of suffering, he says, is abandoned. The land is not yet loved. That land, the land is the other's possession. The poetics of the land cannot then be a poetics of thrift, of patient repossession, of anticipation. It is a poetics of excess, where all is exhausted immediately. We expose the landscape to these various kinds of madness that they have put on us. Exiled from diasporic homelands, Montserrat finds this British landscape, although very familiar, to be problematic. But her reaction is to work through this dilemma of alienation by literally attaching herself to it. Montserrat exposes Montserrat exposes the land to the madness to her madness of frantic digging and naked, naked exuberance as this dreamlike space of bucolic life she has inhabited. This North, North Yorkshire rural environment needs this act of slimy reclamation to truly become hers. It's almost as though she has to dig into the land to move away from its bucolic nature, to dig into the land, into the dirt, into the mud, to say no to bucolism, to say no to the bucolic nature of this environment or to problematize that bucolic nature. It is the very locality of the place, its importance to her personally that enables the power of the art. As Lucy Lippard reminds us, the intersection of nature, culture, history and ideology form the ground on which we stand. Our land, our place, the local, the lure of the local is a pull of the place that operates on all of us, exposing our politics and our spiritual legacies. This claiming of rural northern space is vital because of Montserrat's experience of unbelonging caused by current racism that denies her rights in the present day home space. As Claudette Johnson has said, the horrors of slavery and racism have left us with the knowledge that every aspect of our existence is open to abuse. This is reinforced by the experience of a kind of social and cultural invisibility. It is to counter, counter this loss of a sense of ownership of both land and body that Montserrat creates a dynamic performance of her body working its way into ownership of the land she inhabits. Despite her claims to ownership, she's a vagrant, vagabond presence in a landscape owned by aristocratic masters. She filmed clay on land that she's lived on most of her life, but that is a private shooting estate. And uh, uh, to an extent, I wanted to show you next, Labaina Himid's Naming the Money, to sort of contrast the kind of different ways that black artists have to talk about uh, alienation and a diaspora. And this work talks to those bodies that uh, came across as slave servants in the uh, uh, 16th, 17th, 18th and 19th century. And how these bodies, uh, uh, she, she provides them with lives apart from their lives as slave servants and shows these lives going onwards. The elision of black people in the landscape has led some theorists to describe African diasporic historical present as spectral. Ian Balcom theorizes that absence thus. If the general task of what I'm calling the testamentary 
melancholy realist counter discourse of modernity is to recover the lost, to acknowledge and take some effective property in the ruinous past, continuously, if non synchronously, present within now being, and then the particular task of an interested cosmopolitanism is not merely to make the past present, but to render the unseen visible, to bear witness to the truth of what has not been and cannot have been witnessed. Montserrat's recovery of the lost history of black presence renders this unseen population visible despite their elision from most historical narratives. She literally makes the past present by reinserting the black body in the frame. She's interested in upturning the legacy of this elision of past black histories in these northern environs and the consequent amnesia which creates a vacuum where black people once lived, walked and laboured. She wants to give flesh to what have been ghostly spectral voices and images. Here are the ghostly spectral voices and imagery. Run away from Dent in Yorkshire on Monday the 18th of August 1758. Thomas Anderson, a Negro man, etc., etc. These are runaway slave slaves brought together in 2018. So these lives were not even uh, necessarily out there when uh, uh, Montserrat created her piece in 2015, but her, her, her piece was already speaking to them. On the other side of Yorkshire from Scarborough, miles across the moors, an African slave is here shown to have absconded from his martyr's home in an isolated part of the country. He would have walked rural Yorkshire as an escaped slave, as Montserrat was to do 250 years later. But he's a fugitive seeking to escape the shackles. And here in Lancashire too, in the uh, semi-rural north in Heesham, uh, an Ibu boy runs away with African scarification marks. And look at this, he speaks broad Lancashire dialect. I think this is the first instance, written instance of a black man speaking in broad Lancashire dialect. Only came to light in 2018. And is owned by a reverend, by a, a, a church minister. I can go, I go on a lot about this, I'll, 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 for, for time I'll, 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 I'll not go on about it now, but you can ask questions about it in the, in, in the question time. But the important thing is that she is bringing back to life these, 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 these individuals who have been forgotten by history right up until the present time and are only just being remembered. The vagrant, vagabond nature of slave runaways can be illuminated and exemplified by Pete Bogg, a companion video performance piece to Clay made by Montserrat. Running through a landscape of Pete Bogg's, a clothed Montserrat is filmed with lengthy close ups of her feet in the muddy watercourses, showing her lovingly at home in this bog boggy landscape and joyfully emancipated. Extended. Alan, Alan yep. apologies. Yes, about three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Yeah. Uh, shots of her feet indicate the long distance fugitive feet will need to travel, as well as the deep connection of those feet to the North British landscape. And here in toes, the words say, you'll have to be on your toes to survive these parts. This is an amazing piece. Uh, I could actually show you the real one because it's downstairs in my front room, but I, I decided not to have that boast. But as you can see, it's an amazing piece which has embedded in the feet the kind of deep time of uh, a different place. I say Africa, she says Asia, she, she says these are Buddhist, um, uh, 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 they're based on Buddhist, Buddhist uh, 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 sculptures. I think, I, think that, I think they're more general than that, but me and Jade can have that argument. Um, but Toes shows her embedded in this, in, in this, in this, in this Yorkshire earth, but taking with her the uh, her African roots. Uh, so then, uh, in a in a piece called "No Need for Clothing," she uh, goes even further, um, uh, taking the texts uh, which she works with into the uh, art galleries, and uh, she uses charcoal. 
and she uses charcoal for a very specific reason, which is that the charcoal is um, uh, uh, contagious, that people who go to this exhibit end up with charcoal on their bodies as she has charcoal on her bodies as she makes it. Um, so uh, I'll, just, uh, I'll just end with the final. The drawing material leaves a trace on the audience. They're implicated. If they come to see the work, they become part of the work quite, quite naturally because the carbon is already in the air. They're going to be absorbing it. The drawing is also located in the choreography of the body around the space. So there are layers of a kind of drawing. Some will leave material traces. Some will leave traces of memory. So what, what this, this work talks to is the charcoal performs a function as a trace that cannot be elided like the black history it symbolizes. One of the texts she's graffitied on the wall of the galleries and made into watercolor that she called hair is exemplary. It states her, her hair like histories flattened, ironed and creased. So flattened, ironed and erased. Her hair like histories flattened, ironed and erased. And I've got last four or five sentences. Montserrat's whole praxis works against the, this, this distortion an erasure of black history. In his discussion of the archive and testimony, Giorgio Agamben posits her how what we have left stands in for what is lost. And charcoal and its contagion is Montserrat's remnant. Agamben describes how in the end, the remnant appears as a redemptive machine, allowing for the salvation of the very whole, whose division and loss it had signified. Montserrat's praxis here, like that in clay, labours and works through a messy physicality that is as much part of the artwork as a finished piece. Her redemptive machine seeks to restore a lost black history, deals with the horrors of present racial realities and posits new black futures through collaborative political actions symbolised by her contagious praxis. Thank you.